Welcome to prayer meeting. Our devotional thoughts tonight are God spoke through Christ. And we'll be looking at Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and then chapter 2, verses 5 through 12. So you'll have to kind of look through your page there a little to follow through. So, chapter 1, verse 1, God, had, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. God has always revealed himself to mankind throughout history, whether or not we wanted to hear from him. Okay? In these last days, including the days in which we are now living, God has spoken to us through Jesus Christ. And specifically, he spoke in the atonement through which we can be saved and brought into a right relationship with God. Do you want to know what God looks like? Well, the writer of Hebrews says to look at Jesus, who is what? the express image of his person. Or we can say, God's Son has all the brightness of God's own glory and is like him in every way. So, the majority of mankind is totally aware, unaware of and unconcerned over the person of Jesus. Yet, he is constantly involved in all the happenings around us. A lot of people can't see that. But Jesus is being involved in everything that's going around. Well, how do you know that? Well, the writer says he upholds all things by the word of his power. How many things are all things? <laughs> okay, that's rather comprehensive, don't you think? So as you read the newspaper or listen to the news on the radio or see it on the television set, regardless of what it looks like, he is upholding all things by the word of his power. So much happening around us is evil and ungodly, but that does not negate the power of Christ in the world today. His power is in his word. And that word rebukes and puts judgment on the evil and the ungodliness. Yet, mankind still chooses to follow evil and ungodliness in spite of the consequences. The power of his word is not just him saying, hey guys, I told you so. It also empowers those who submit to and continually follow his word. There is power to keep and safeguard those who are committed to following Jesus. The power of his word is most evident in the power of the atonement from sin. We're told that Jesus is the expression of God's love for the human race. And this love remains constant no matter how far away humanity runs away from God. You cannot outrun the love of God, okay? Because of all the evil and all the ungodliness in the world is human sin. And Jesus is the answer and the solution to the sin problem because he has personally paid the price for all human sin in the justice of God. And he personally sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven to ensure that 
those who believe him and repent are forgiven and cleansed from all sin. But it is not just forgiveness that is evident in his power. His power enables us to faithfully live out what his word teaches us in our everyday lives. Looking at chapter 2, verse 5. For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God, might taste death for who? Everyone. Everybody. The writer bases his thoughts here on what is said about Jesus in Psalm 8, verses 4 through 6. It's a direct quote. What a wonderful blessing to us that he loves us so much that he made the way for our sins to be forgiven. God always wants us to be reminded of it. Okay? We need to be reminded daily. Why? Well, we face temptation daily. We need to be reminded in the face of those temptations that Jesus has already paid the price for sin. If we've been forgiven, we've been cleansed, there's no reason to give in to sin. But Lord, we can reach out for that grace of God to sustain us and keep us in those times of temptation. And the psalm says that God created mankind a little lower than the angels. Well, angels are not better than people. They're just different. Think about that for just a moment. Angels are not better than people. They're just different. They are beings that were created holy with the purpose of serving God in his dealings with mankind. That's who those beings are. And while these angelic beings are holy, their holiness is natural to them because of their creation. You see, they have no choice. They're created holy. Mankind is lower, not in the sense of being inferior but because of his position on earth and the probationary nature of his existence. It is in this condition that human life has a glory the angels cannot comprehend. That glory is the fact that we have free will. Angels don't have free will. But you, my friend, have free will. We choose whether or not to serve God, a choice the angels do not have. And with that free will and through creation, he gave us the responsibility to take care of this creation. The world we live in is subject to what we do. Angels have no part in this. In fact, there's nothing in this world that the actions of mankind cannot affect. We can use this world to do good, and we can use this world to do evil. History shows we failed God and that we chose to sin and rebel against the rule of God in our personal lives. So things in this world then are not just as God had created them. 
right? Sin came in. By the grace of God, Jesus came into this world and he tasted death for everyone. He took on human life and lived a human life under the same rules and the same conditions we all have to live our lives. He was tempted in all the ways we are tempted. He faced all the evil thoughts we face, and yet he committed no sin. He went to the cross, totally innocent of sin, for the purpose of redeeming mankind from the curse of personal sin. Saying that Jesus tasted death for everyone means that he took personal responsibility for the sins you committed. He did the only thing that makes it possible for God to forgive your sins and to make you righteous. He died on the cross. And because of this, anyone can be saved from sin and be brought into a right relationship with God. I'm thankful for that. I hope you are. Looking now, verse 10 through 12. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons of glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. In order to deal with our sin problem, God had to make the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ, suffer the penalty of our sin. It is not possible for us to comprehend what it meant for Jesus to take on human form, for him to be tempted, and then to take on the responsibility for everyone's sin when he had committed no sin at all. We just can't comprehend that. The Bible says that when we accept Christ as our Savior, we become one with him, and also we become one with all other saved people. Isn't that a wonderful thing? When we get saved, we, we have a family automatically. A whole lot of them we don't even know. Some of them we do. And it's a wonderful thing. God glorifies Christ for his part in the atonement. Should we not also glorify him for what he has done? After all, we are the ones that receive the benefit, aren't we? So, God spoke to us through Christ. The writer closes his thought, quoting Psalm 22, verse 22. He says, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. So, have you told anyone what Christ has done for you? Okay. Would you be willing to sing a song of praise to God? If so, what would that song be? What would that song be? Amen.